Section 54 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. The World Story, Volume 3. Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tabham. Section 54. Traditions of the Sheikhs of Morocco, 16th century by T. H. Weyer. The Sheikhs or mystics were those who sought to know God directly, and not through a third person or through a book. The Editor. 1. The Miracle of the Palm Tree. The Sheikh of Ibn Mubarak was a worker of miracles. On one occasion, a number of tribesmen arrived at his abode, so it is related, and he ordered gruel to be cooked for them, all in baskets made of palm boughs, which they placed upon the fire, for all the ball as though they had been pots of iron. When fighting broke out between the tribes and civil wars arose, Ibn Mubarak would send to them, bidding them desist and lay down their arms, and condign punishment overtook all who ventured to set at naught his commands. Moreover, he set apart three days in every month in which the carrying of arms was prohibited altogether, and a man was forbidden on them to quarrel with his neighbor. The people called these days the days of Ibn Mubarak and on them a man would foregather with the murderer of his father and with the murderer of his child and not be able to speak with them this was the recognized custom both amongst the arab and amongst the berber tribes of the Sioux and the country towards the south during these peaceful days even the beasts of the forest were safe from the hunter it is said that an Arab found a Jerboa on one of these days, and his companion bade him, Let it go, for this is a day of the days of the peace of our Lord Ibn Mubarak. The Arabs, however, could not desist, and shooting at the Jerboa, wounded it in the foot. But at the same moment the Arab shrieked with pain, for his own foot was broken, and he never walked upon it more. One of the sheikhs who belonged to the great Berber tribes of the Mesmuda, to which Ibn Mubarak also belonged, used to relate the following instance of his wonder-working skill. He told it to his son, who in turn recounted it to Ibn Askar. I was once, said he, encamped in the grove of palm trees along with thy mother, and I went aside to perform the legal ablution, leaving thy mother where she was amid the palms. As she sat there, her eye fell upon a cluster of dates at the top of a lofty palm, far beyond her reach, so tall and straight was the palm tree trunk. Thereupon she said aloud, By thy leave, O my lord of Namubarak, I would to God he would send me one who would cut off for me yonder bunch of days. And thereupon she turned herself, and behold, behind her a man who stretched forth his hand towards the head of the palm tree, and the palm tree bowed down its head toward him, and he cut off the bunch of dates and cast it towards the spot where the woman was sitting. Eat, said he. Thank God and honor thy husband. He then vanished from her sight like a glance of the eye, and the palm tree returned as it had been before, erect and tall. The mother, continued the narrator, remained speechless with astonishment. This is a miracle which I have witnessed. At once she exclaimed, and when she had related to me the adventure, I asked her what manner of man he was that had appeared to her. And when she had described him, It was Master Ibn Mubarak, I said, by the Lord of the Kaaba, for I knew him. 2. The Sheikh who was as good as a timepiece. 
The fame of more than one of the saints and sheikhs rested upon the sweet tones of the voice in the reciting of the Quran. One such was the sheikh Abu Hafs Omar, who belonged to one of the Arab tribes of the country, but who had taken up his abode in the city of Meknes, and there also he died about the year 1540. He was a man much given to ascetism and to seclusion from the world. Every night he spent the interval between the two evening prayers in the recitation of the Quran, opening and closing the recital with a prayer. He would begin immediately after the sunset prayer and complete the prescribed portion immediately before the night prayer. And so accurately did he gauge the interval that the moment he ceased reading, people knew that the hour for the night prayer had come, and the next instant the call to that prayer would ring out from the minarets. This happened not occasionally, but night after night. He never came to the end of the prescribed portion, a moment too soon, nor a moment too late. For all that the call to prayers in that city of Meknes is sounded with extreme of punctuality. 3. The Sheikh Who Must Be Obeyed The Sheikh Abu Ravian was one of the wonders of the age and the marvel of his generation, after the way of the school of the Malamatia or cynics. His words were the words of the covetous, and his talk the talk of the miser. Yet he would rise in the morning rich and go to bed a beggar. All he had he gave to the poor and distributed his goods to the needy. He passed his days in ecstasy and walked the world as in a dream. If he chanced to meet a prince or happened upon any of the great ones of the earth, by thine office of me, he would say to him, for so much, and if the prince gave heed to his words and paid the price he asked, Thou art secure, he would tell him, but if he disregarded his demand and refused his price, he would tell him, Thou art deposed, and his word would come to pass as if by the predestination of God. Now when the Sultan Muhammad the Sheikh had conquered the town of Meknes, and was making persistent efforts to take by storm the city of Fez, one day Abu Rabiyan appeared before him and stood in his presence. Buy Fez of me for five hundred dinars, said Abu Rabiyan to the Sultan. But the Sultan scorned his demand and refused his price. God has never laid such a condition upon any Sultan, quoth he. Neither is there anything like it in the law. By Allah, swore Abu Ravian. Thou shalt not enter first this year. Weeks passed, and months slipped by, and the Sultan made no progress with the siege of Fez, nor any advance except into deeper despair of ever taking the town. At last the Prince Abdul Qadir gave good counsel to his father, and spoke before him wise words. O oh, my father! said he do as the sheikh abu ravian has with thee and pay him the price he has asked for he is indeed a mighty sheikh and a holy one of the saints of god and he slacked not to urge his father nor ceased to goad him on until he yielded to his importunity and gave him leave to make terms with the sheikh pay the money was all the sheikh would say, and he abated not a dirham of his price. So the prince Abdul Qadir yielded him the bargain and paid him the money. By the end of the year, said Abu Rabian as he received the money and closed the transaction, by the end of the year God will finish the matter, and my affair is in the hand of God. Exalted be his name. And forthwith the sheikh scattered the money amongst the poor and distributed it to all who were in want and did not keep for himself so much as a dirham 
and from that very day the sultan began to have the upper and not the underhand until when the year had passed and its months had come to an end he took possession of Fez and entered the city in triumph many are the anecdotes related of abu Ravyan and the tales told concerning him to pick one berry from the cluster and choose one grain out of the bushel it is related by more than one of the fakis of al Kasrhal, when the government of that town was in the hand of the Kaid abdul wahid the arusi and he shared it with a company of his relatives of the beni hamid then abu Ravian arrived in the town and abode in it one night but no sooner had he entered its gates and set his foot within its walls then he went straightway into the mosque and get him up to the top of the minaret there he stood looking down upon the town and the people in the streets could see him standing then he called at the pitch of his voice and cried aloud so that all could hear o beni hamid buy of me al cast or get you gone from it this very year and the people heard the sheikh's words and spoke them in the ears of the kaid abdul wahid if al cast belonged to him said the kaid when he heard them and if the town were in his hand he might deprive us of it or drive us forth from it when we have no other matter to think of no rot better to distract our attention we will attend to the words of an imbecile and obey the commands of a madman the next day the sheikh left the country and as he left he said the kaid abdul wahid will go out of this town and the beni hamid will be driven forth from it and they will not return to it again for ever and the event befell as the sheikh foretold even so it came to pass in the providence of god whose name be exalted there was in meknes a famous fakih and preacher harzus by name and to him the sheikh abu Ravian one day sent a message by a messenger by thy soul of me wrote abu Ravian, but the fakih harzus closed his ears and steeled his heart and the sheikh's messenger returned to his master and told him go back to him once more said abu Ravian, and say to him thou wilt be slaughtered like a beast thou and thy son and ye both will be hanged over the door of your own house in the garb when the fakih heard these words he was seized with panic and his heart became like wax he girded up his skirts and ran forth going like an ostrich and he neither stayed to rest nor stopped to drink until he came to the sheikh's house and stood before abu Ravian. oh my master said he what is this that thou sayest and what are these ill-boding words some error hath occurred quoth abu Ravian. but he spake in bitter jest and the fakih knew it oh sir cried he we will do all that thou layest upon us there will not be but what has been answered abu Ravian. time went on until three months had passed and the matter delayed and the sheikh's words had not come to pass but when three months had come and gone the prophecy was fulfilled and the threat was executed as we shall show when we come to the story of the faki and preacher harsus of the meknes if god will exalted be his name to the son also of this faki and preacher harsus did the sheikh abu Ravian foretell their dreadful end for as he sat one day at the door of his house and the street before it ran with mud and mire abu Ravian passed by clad in his finest clothes and decked in his best attire for he was on his way to the mosque and was proceeding to the place of prayer then the soul of the son of harsus was smitten with envy and he thought to spoil the sheikh's fine raiment if thou love god quoth he roll in this mud and he pointed to the street before him and indicated the flowing mire and abu Ravian rolled in that mud even as a mule rolls in the sand and all because the other had adjured him by the name of god art content now asked abu Ravian. 
Content, returned the son of the fakih Harzus. Then said the sheikh Abu Rabian, Even thus shalt thou roll, thou and thy father, in chains. And the thing fell out as he had said, and the event occurred as he had predicted. Many a similar story is told of the sheikh Abu Rabian, and many a like tale is handed down concerning him. 4. The Sheikh Zituni and the Bees The Sheikh Zituni was a great traveler and a worker of miracles. He was black of color and blind, and one whose prayers were always answered. Some of the mystics indeed used to call him the blind serpent, which does not bite those whom it stings, on account of the rapidity with which the answers to his prayers came. He it was who escorted the caravans from the west in the pilgrimages to the holy house of God in Mecca, and to the grace of his prophet. And even the Arabs of Enged, and Zab, and of Tunis, for all their courage and rebellious spirit, dared not attack the caravans led by the Sheikh Zaytouni, for they saw the wonderful things which God brought to pass at his hands, and experienced the extent of his power. One of the excellent among those who traveled with him, a man of worth and veracity, gives the following description of an incident which befell their caravan and adventure which they met with. In one of the Sheikh Zaytouni's journeys with the pilgrims, he says, no sooner had we alighted on one occasion in the Zab than we found ourselves surrounded by the horsemen of the wild Arabs on every side, intent on plunder, bent on spoil. In our distress, we begged the Sheikh for aid and told him what had befallen us. And from which side did they come? he asked. From every side, we replied. The sheikh thereupon took up a handful of dust and threw it towards his right side, and then another which he threw to his left, then a third handful which he threw before him, and a fourth which he threw behind his back, and immediately there came forth from that dust, as it had been an inundation of bees, which scared the horses of the Arabs, and they vanished from our sight as a mist vanishes before the sun, and the people were astonished and marveled greatly. When the day was over, the Arabs appeared once more on foot, bringing with them their wives and children, and driving before them herds of cattle and flocks of sheep and goats, being desirous to be reconciled to the sheikh and to obtain of him his blessing, such was their terror of those bees. And the Arabs of those parts relate how, on coming for plunder to a caravan in which the sheikh Zaytouni was, they would find it surrounded by a wall which none could scale nor any dig through. The following is the Sheikh Zaytouni's recipe for rendering an encampment impregnable, as it is given by his pupil Ahmad Zarouk. He would commence by saying, I take refuge in God from Satan accursed. Next he would begin to march round the encampment, reciting as he did so the 97th chapter of the Quran, until he sealed the circuit at the point where he had begun. Then verily the camp would be safe and secure from robber and thief, and God would indeed build around the encampment a wall which no thief could either scale nor dig through. This is of the things as to which there is no doubt, and the fact which is beyond question. End of section 54. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. Section 55 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angelique Campbell. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 55, Morocco Law, 16th Century, by Mondo de Amicis i have discovered that one of the soldiers of the palace guard has lost his right ear and they tell me that it was cut off legally and in the presence of witnesses 
by another soldier whom he had deprived the corresponding year some time before such is the law of retaliation as it is interpreted in morocco not only may any of the relatives of a murdered man kill the murderer on the same day of the week at the same hour on the spot where the crime was committed and with the same weapon but whoever loses one of his members by violence can inflict a similar injury upon him who did the deed in this connection i was told by an attache of the french legation at mogador of a very curious incident that occurred at that place some years ago one of the persons concerned being personally known to him an english merchant of mogador was returning to the city on the evening of a market day and arrived at the gate just when a crowd of peasants was pouring through leading their asses and camels although he shouted balak balak make room make room until he was tired an old moorish woman was thrown down by his horse striking her face against a stone as ill luck would have it she knocked out the last two remaining teeth in her under jaw for a moment she seemed dazed but recovered herself quickly and rose to her feet in a furious rage bursting into a torrent of abuse and curses she followed the englishman to his house and then went off in search of the cave to demand in accordance with the law of retaliation that the nazarene's two corresponding teeth should be knocked out the cade endeavoured to pacify her and advised forgiveness but finding that he could do nothing he finally dismissed her promising to see that justice was done hoping that little by little she would calm down and abandon her project but at the end of three days back she came angrier than ever to demand her rights and insisting that a formal sentence should be pronounced then and there upon the christian remember said she you have promised eh <laughs> cried the cade you take me for a christian too if you suppose that i am the slave of my word for three months did that old woman continue to present herself daily at the entrance to the citadel crying out threatening and making such a noise generally that the cade at last to get rid of her was forced to give in sending for the merchant he set the matter before him the old woman's grievance her rights under the law and the duty required of him by his promise ending by begging him to put a stop to the affair by consenting to have two of his teeth drawn out any two it made no difference which as long as in accordance with the law they were incisors but the merchant declined not only as regarded his incisors but his eye teeth and his molars as well and there was nothing for the cave to do but send the old woman off and tell the guards not to allow her to set foot in the casbah again very well said she since there are only degenerate mussulmans left here and mussulman women the mothers of the sharifs can no longer get justice done them against dogs of infidels i shall go to the sultan and we shall soon see if the prince of the faithful abjures the law of the prophet as well true to her word she set forth on her journey entirely alone with an amulet in her breast a staff in her hand and a knapsack strapped across her shoulders and succeeded in walking the entire hundred leagues which divide mogador from the sacred city of the empire on reaching fez she demanded an interview with the sultan and proceeded to state her case demanding in accordance with her rights as laid down in the koran an application of the law of retaliation the sultan exhorted her to show forgiveness but she persisted he then explained to her the grave difficulties that stood in the way of satisfying her demands how the english consul would never give his consent and the government would consequently find itself in a serious lawsuit how impossible it was for so trifling a cause to jeopardize the peace of the entire empire and disturb the good understanding which then existed between the government of the sharifs and powerful england the old moor remained inexorable she was now offered on condition that she would abandon the matter a sum of money large enough to support her in comfort for the rest of her life she refused what do i want with your money said she i am old and accustomed to poverty what i want is two of that christian's teeth i want them i have a right to them and i demand them in the name of the koran and the sultan prince of the faithful head of islamism father of his people cannot refuse to render justice to a muslim woman this obstinacy placed the sultan in a very awkward position 
the law was precise and her rights under it incontestable while the popular excitement had been wrought to such a pitch by her inflammatory speeches that it would be dangerous to refuse her demands the sultan it was abderrahman wrote to the english consul asking him as a favor to try to persuade his fellow countrymen to allow two of his teeth to be knocked out to which the merchant replied that he would never agree then the sultan wrote again promising to concede any mercantile privileges that he might wish in return for his consent and this time having been approached through his pocket the merchant gave in the old woman left fez blessing the name of the pious abdurrahman and returned to mogador where in the presence of herself and a large gathering of witnesses two of the nazarene's teeth were knocked out when she saw them fall to the ground she gave a howl of triumph and seized them with savage joy the merchant however thanks to the special privileges he enjoyed made a large fortune in less than two years and returned to england toothless but happy end of section fifty five this recording is in the public domain section fifty six of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org by april six zero nine zero california united states of america hawking in algeria painting page three hundred and twenty two by eugene fromentin french painter eighteen twenty to eighteen seventy six for hawking or falconry falcons are so trained that after making a capture they will surrender it to their masters this is one of the most ancient sports and has been practiced for many centuries in the days of the norman kings in england hawking was treated as seriously as a science and a man's rank was indicated by the character of the falcon which he bore on his wrist falconry has its own language a mature hawk is a haggard a young one taken in its migration is a passage hawk to train these birds is called reclaiming to flutter is to bait to fight with one another is to crab to sleep is to joke the prey is the quarry in northern africa falconry is as much delighted in as it ever was in the earlier days the best hunter is the female or the peregrine falcon the fiercest of all birds of prey the birds are always loosed with the cry in the name of allah god the great allah as no animal may be lawfully eaten by mohammedans over which these words have not been pronounced before its slaughter the illustration presents a characteristic hawking scene in algeria the arab hunters are pausing at the foot of a rocky precipice their falcons held aloft on their wrists they are mounted on superb horses the white one in the front of the picture where every curve of his perfectly moulded figure stands out against the dark background the two riders and also their steeds are giving close attention to the attendants at the left who are caring for some small animal that has already been captured end of section fifty six this recording is in the public domain section fifty seven of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by fano jahangiri the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tapham section fifty seven one day in morocco nineteenth century by edmundo du amesis we made an early start for Zakota, inspired by the thought that on that day we should behold the mountains of Fez in the distance. There was an autumnal freshness in the air, and a light mist obscured the surrounding country. A crowd of Arabs wrapped in their cloaks formed two wings at the entrance to the camp. The soldiers of the escort were huddled together in a close chilly group behind us, and the children of the neighboring dwarves gazed out with sleepy eyes from behind the tents and hedges ere long however all this changed the sun came out the spectators crowded around us the horsemen scattered in all directions 
The air resounded with shouts and the rapid reports of firearms, and everything became suddenly bright, animated, full of life and color, while the autumnal cold was succeeded, as is always the case in that climate, by the burning heat of summer. Among my notes of that morning I find one which says laconically, Grasshopper's sample of Salam's eloquence. I remember, in fact, to have noticed a field some distance off that seemed to be in motion, an effect produced by an enormous number of green grasshoppers coming towards us in leaps. Salam, who happened to be riding beside me just then, gave me an admirably picturesque description of the incursions of those terrible insects, which I remember word by word. But how can I possibly render the effect of his gestures, his expression, and the tones of his voice, which really told more than the words themselves? It is frightful, signor. They come from over there, pointing to the south, like a black cloud. The noise is heard from afar. They come, they come, and at their head, their sultan, their sultan Gerard, who leads them on. They cover the roads, the fields, houses, dwarfs, forests. The cloud grows larger and larger, on and on and on, dying and consuming. Over rivers, over ditches, over walls, through fire, the grass is destroyed, the flowers, the leaves, the fruit, the grain, the bark of the trees, on and on. No one can stop them. Not flaming tribes, not the sultan with his army, not all the people of Morocco assembled together. Heaps of dead grasshoppers. For what go the living? Do ten die? A hundred are born. Do a hundred die? A thousand are born. Such size at ten years? The streets covered, gardens covered, seashores covered, sea covered, everything green, everything in motion, living, dead, decayed, offensive, a plague, a pestilence, a curse from God. And this is really so. The fetid odor arising from myriads of dead grasshoppers sometimes produced a contagious form of fever. And to cite one instance, the terrible plague which in 1799 fairly depopulated both the towns and country of Bombay, broke out just after one of these visitations. When the advance guard of the invading army appears, the Arabs go forward to meet it, in parties of four or five hundred, with sticks, clubs, and firebrands, but only succeed in forcing the enemy to deviate somewhat from its course, and it occasionally happens that when one tribe drives them back thus from their own into the district of a neighboring tribe, the grasshopper war is converted into a civil war. The only thing that frees the country from this curse is a favorable wind. This blows them into the sea where they drown and are swept up on the beach for days afterwards in great heaps. When the favorable wind still delays, the only possible consolation left the inhabitants is to eat their enemies. This they do before they have laid their eggs, boiling them and adding a seasoning of salt, pepper and vinegar. They taste a little like sea crabs, and as many as 400 can be eaten in a single day. About two miles from camp, we overtook that part of the caravan which was bearing Victor Emmanuel's presence to Fez. White camels were harnessed together two by two in tandem fashion by long poles attached to either side of the saddle, from which swung the cases. They were in charge of some Arabs on foot and some mounted soldiers, and at their head was a wagon drawn by two oxen, the only wagon we had seen in Morocco. It had been especially made at El Araish upon the model, I should say, of the first vehicle that ever appeared on the earth's surface, squat, heavy, ill-formed with wheels composed of solid blocks of wood, and the most curious and absurd-looking harness that could possibly be imagined. But to the inhabitants of the Duars, most of whom had in all probability never seen a wheeled vehicle before, it was a marvel. They ran to behold it from all directions, pointed it out to each other, followed behind and walked in front of it with visible excitement. Even our mules, unaccustomed to the sight of such objects, showed great reluctance to pass it, some planting themselves stubbornly on their forefeet, and others wheeling completely around. Salam himself regarded it with a certain complacency, as though saying, That was made in our country, and this was excusable, seeing that in all Morocco there are very likely no more wagons than pianos, which, if the estimate of a French consul is correct, would reduce the number to about a dozen. 
There seems indeed to be a certain antipathy to vehicles of every kind. The Tangier authorities, for example, forbade Prince Frederick of hesse darmstadt when he was there in 1839 to ride out in a carriage. The prince wrote to the sultan, offering to have the principal streets paved at his own expense, provided the permission refused by the authorities were granted him. I will grant it most willingly, replied the sultan, but upon one condition that the carriage shall have no wheels, since as protectors of the faithful I cannot permit my subjects to be exposed to the risk of being run over by a Christian. Whereupon the prince, to turn the whole thing into ridicule, took him at his word, and there are people in Tangiers now, who remember seeing him going about the town in a carriage without wheels, suspended between two wheels. At last we reached that blessed hill for which for three days past the caravan had been looking with such longing impatience. After making a tedious ascent, we passed through a narrow gorge called in Arabic Bentinja, which we were obliged to take single file and came out above a charming valley, flowery and solitary, into which the caravan descended in festive style, filling the air with shouts and bursts of song. At the foot of the valley, we came upon another body of soldiers belonging to the military colonies, come to relieve the first. There were a hundred of them. Very old and very young, dark long-haired, some of them mounted on enormous horses with housings of unusual splendor. Their Kaid, Abu Ben Jilali, was a sturdy old man of severe aspect and curt manner, of whom and of his soldiers one might have said, as Don Abodonio, did of the anonymous leader and the assassins. I can well understand that to control such faces, as those nothing less is needed than such a face as that, without so much as a glance as the fields of ripening wheat and barley that lined the road on either side, the soldiers urged their horses forward and scattering in all directions on a full gallop, began the powder play five and ten firing at a time into the air, wheeling to left and right, turning about in their saddles in every conceivable manner, and yelling all the while like demons. One of them whirled his gun around with such rapidity that it could hardly be seen. Another, as he flew by, shouted in a tremendous voice, Here comes the thunderbolt! A third, whose horse had swerved a little, came within a hair's breadth of landing in our midst and throwing us all to the ground with our heels in the air. At a certain point, the ambassador and captain, accompanied by Hamed ben Kassen, and a few soldiers separated from the rest of the caravan and went off to make the ascent of a mountain a few miles away while we continued our route. A few minutes later, an incident occurred which I am not likely ever to forget. A half-naked Arab boy, about sixteen or eighteen years old, came towards us, driving two recalled citrant oxen by the aid of a heavy stick. The Kate Abu Ben Jalali stopped his horse and caught him. We learned afterwards that the oxen were to have been attached to the wagon which we had passed not long before, and that they were several hours behind time. The unfortunate boy approached trembling and stood before the Kate, who put some question to him. I did not understand. The lad stammered the reply and went white as death. Fifty lashes, said the Kate curtly, turning to his men. Three powerful fellows at once leaped from their horses, and the poor wretch, without waiting for them to lay hold of him, without uttering a single word, or so much as raising his eyes to the countenance of his judge, threw himself flat on his face, and, as the custom is, with arms and legs extended, all of this had transpired in an instant, but the stick had not been lifted in the air before the commander and some of the others, dashing into the midst of the group, had made the Kate understand that they could not think of permitting such a brutal punishment to be inflicted. Abu Ben Jalali inclined his head, and the boy rose, pale with convulsed features, gazing alternately at his deliverers and the Kate with an expression of mingled fear and astonishment. Go, said the interpreter. You are free. Ah, he cried, with an intonation that cannot be conveyed, and quick as lightning, disappeared. We proceeded in on our way, but I must say that although I had seen a man killed, 
i have never experienced such feelings of profound horror as when i beheld that half-naked boy stretched out on the ground to receive his fifty lashes and after the horror of the thing my blood began to boil and, and i denounced the kaid the sultan morocco and its inhumanity in the most violent terms it is however undoubtedly better to wait for second thoughts but how about ourselves i presently reflected how many years is it since we abolished whipping and how many since it was abolished in austria and in prussia and throughout the rest of europe these thoughts had the effect of somewhat curbing my righteous indignation and i was left with only a strong feeling of bitterness if any one cares to know how whipping is conducted in morocco suffice it to say that when the operation is completed it sometimes happens that the victim is carried to the cemetery during the remainder of the ride to zakota the caravan passed over a succession of hills and valleys the road running between fields of wheat and barley and bright green pasture bordered with aloes indian figs wild olives dwarf oaks ivy strawberry trees myrtles and flowery shrubs not a tent was in sight not a living soul to be seen the country was as luxuriant silent and deserted as an enchanted garden once on reaching the top of a certain hill we descried the blue summits of the fez mountains which however immediately disappeared again as though they had merely raised their heads a moment to see us pass in the hottest part of the day we arrived at zakota this was one of the most exquisite spots we saw throughout the entire trip the camp was pitched on the mountain side in a great rocky cavity shaped like an amphitheater and worn by the successive passage back and forth of man and beast into innumerable paths one above the other whose more or less regular lines had the effect of graduated seats and as a matter of fact these tires were at that very moment crowded with arabs who sat on the ground in semicircles like spectators in some actual amphitheater Below us lay a wide, basin-shaped plain, whose cultivated fields made it look like a huge checkerboard, with squares of green, yellow, white, red, and purple silk and velvet. Looking through field glasses, we could see on the more distant hills here a row of tents, there a koba, half hidden among the aloes, in one place a camel, beyond it an Arab lying on the ground, a herd of cattle, a group of women, a sluggish and frequent signs of life that made one feel more forcibly than their entire absence would have done the profound peacefulness of the scene. Above all this loveliness, a white blazing blinding sky forcing one to bow his head and half close his eyes. But it is not so much the beauties of nature that make Zagota an undying memory with me as a certain experiment I made there with Kif. Kif, let me say, for the benefit of those who are unfamiliar with it, is the leaf of a sort of hemp called hashish, celebrated throughout the East for its narcotic qualities. It is much used in Morocco, and it may generally be taken for granted that those Arabs and Moors, so frequently to be seen in the towns, gazing at the passers-by with dull, unseeing eyes, or dragging themselves along like persons stunned by a blow on the head, are victims of this pernicious plant. Most people smoke the kif, mixed with a little tobacco, in tiny clay pipes, or it may be eaten in the form of confectionery, called majun made of butter honey nuts musk and cloves the effects are very peculiar dr migurez who had tried it had often told me of his experience recounting among other things how he was seized with an irresistible desire to laugh and how he seemed to be lifted off the ground so that in passing through a doorway about twice his own height he had bent his head for fear of striking it against the lintel all of this so aroused my curiosity that I several times begged him to give me a little piece of majun, just enough to make me see and feel some of these curious things without absolutely losing control of myself. The worthy doctor at first excused himself, saying that it would be better to make the experiment at Fez, where we would be more conveniently situated. But on my persisting, he at length, a little unwillingly, handed me at Zakota, a plate on which lay the much-desired sweetmeat. We were seated at table. If I mistake not, both Usi and Beseo took a little at 
the same time, but of its effect on them I have no recollection. The majun was like a bit of paste, violet colored and smelling like pomatum. For about half an hour, from the soup that is to the fruit, I felt nothing at all and began to chaff the doctor about his fears, but he only smiled and said, wait, wait. And sure enough, as the fruit was put on the table, the first symptoms of intoxication did begin to manifest themselves. At first they took the form of great hilarity and rapid talking, and then I began to laugh heartily at everything I or anyone else said. Every word that was uttered seemed to me the most exquisite witticism. I laughed at the servants, at the looks of my companions, at my chair as it tilted over, at the design on the china, at the shapes of certain bottles, at the color of the cheese I was eating, until all at once, becoming conscious that I no longer had command of myself, I endeavored to think of something serious in order to regain my self-control. Remembering the boy who was to have been whipped that morning, I felt the greatest interest in him. I would have liked to take him back with me to Italy, to have him educated, to give him a career. I loved him like a son, and the Kate Abu bin Jalali, poor old man. Kate Abu bin Jalali? Why? I loved him too, like a father. And the soldiers of the escort, they were all good fellows ready to defend us, to risk their lives in our behalf. I loved them like brothers. And then the Algerians, I love them as well. Why not, I thought. They are of the same race as the Moroccans. And after all, what race is that? Are we not all brothers, made after one pattern? We should love one another. I love people, and I am happy, and I threw one arm around the doctor's neck, whereupon he burst out laughing. From this cheerful mood, I fell all at once into a state of profound melancholy. All the people whom I had ever offended rose up before me. I recalled every pang I had caused those who loved me, was oppressed by feelings of remorse and unavailing regret. Voices seemed to whisper in my ear in accents of affectionate reproach. I repented, begged for pardon, furtively brushed away the great tear which I felt trembling in the corner of one eye. Then a succession of a strange disconnected memories began to course wildly through my brain. Long forgotten friends of my childhood, certain words of a dialect I had not spoken for twenty years, women's faces, my old regiment, William the Silent, Paris, the editor Barbara, a beaver hat that I had worn as a child, the Acropolis at Athens, my bill at an inn in Seville, a thousand queer fancies. I have a vague recollection of seeing the company look at me smilingly. From time to time I would close my eyes and reopen them without knowing whether I had been asleep or no, whether minutes or hours had elapsed in the interval. Then a clear idea came into my head at last, and I began to speak. Once, I said, I went to... Where was it I went? Who went? Hmm. It had all escaped me. Thoughts sparkled for an instant and expired like fireflies. Crowded, mixed, confused. At one moment I saw Usi with his head elongated, like the reflection in a bad mirror. The vice consul with a face two feet wide. And the others tapered off, swelled out, contorted like extravagant creatures, making grimaces at me that were inexpressibly comic. And I laughed and wagged my head and dozed and thought that they were all crazy. That we were in another world. That nothing I saw was real. That I was not very well. That I did not know where I was. That it was getting strangely dark and silent. When I came to myself, I was lying on my own bed in our tent with the doctor seated beside me, holding a lighted candle and regarding me attentively. There, <laughs> said he, smiling, it is over, but this must be the first and last time. End of section 57. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fano Jahangiri. Section 58 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 60090, California, 
United States of America. The World's Story 3 Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 58 The Great Market of Tripoli Latter Part of the 19th Century By George E. Thompson It is early morning as I walk on the wide expanse of sand extending along the shore outside the white walls of tripoli the sun already shines with the fervent heat from a sky of cloudless blue it shines on a busy scene the usually quiet shore is tenanted by hundreds of arabs negroes and their animals camels donkeys and cattle they still pour in by the various lanes leading through the orange groves and palm forest from the distant oasis of the desert and as they arrive they settle down on the shore in groups some close to the water's edge for there is scarcely any tide here others farther in their place being regulated according to the nature of the produce they have for sale a refreshing breeze blows in over the clear waters of the bay renewing the life of the tired travellers of the night everything is conducted with precision and in perfect order by this ancient people whose manners and customs change not who are the same now as they were centuries ago there may be directors or policemen about and they may have their eye upon me but if so i know them not i wander down the long lines of arabs watching and marvelling as the market grows up rapidly here and there staying to take a photograph with my hand camera finding the folk pleasant and interested rather than otherwise i rush back to my hotel for the tripod camera and am soon at work among the various groups by this time the vast market has assumed the air of an industrial exhibition it is now in full swing and booths are erected in long rows to shelter the occupants from the sun's rays beginning at the far end we find a fine herd of camels for sale then come cattle cows sheep and goats here on the golden sands are pictures of arcadian pastoral or old testament life brilliant with delicious coloring calm reposeful and beautiful long-bearded fine-looking arabs squatting in their barracans or blankets amidst a few clean sheep and goats quietly awaiting purchasers no push no hurry no noise we leave these groups with their delicate coloring lights and shadows and pass down a narrow avenue between the booths of the fruit sellers here are heaps of oranges bananas melons and many a strange product of which we know nothing laid out in long rows on the sand no tables the owners squat behind their goods under a small tent the buyers swarm down the narrow path sometimes seated on a donkey shouting balik make way and so we move on there are the blacksmiths at work and on the sand too in the centre of each group a small charcoal fire burns an arab boy works a pair of bellows looking like two concertinas which he moves alternately a small anvil stands in the sand and filing is done on a large ox bone used as a bench a double row of shoemakers is tense follows the occupants are all at work highly colored red and yellow slippers some of them embroidered are being turned out by the dozen the meat stalls are the only unpleasant feature of this fascinating market for on erections of bamboo canes there are hung up alongside good joints of meat the most loathsome looking entrails yes and it all sells too let us pass on and see what is in the centre of the crowd yonder another picture from arcadia pan with his pipes arab musicians playing on double reeds not high-class music but ancient and pleasing to native ears close by is the pot market water coolers wine jars oil cisterns large and small mostly with pointed bottoms for placing in the sand then there are the basket makers many of them negroes of the blackest hue there are large basin-shaped baskets for fruit round conical-shaped dish covers and small wicker baskets closely made and interwoven with bits of colored cloth the negro women make the latter and so closely that some of them will hold water one woman has two little babies ebony with ivory teeth and eyes fat black merry india rubber sort of babies with little woolly heads and a bracelet or string of red coral for clothing one of these was frightened by the white man and hid its face while i bought a basket from its mother i coaxed it with a copper and left it thinking 
that the white man was not so bad after all as a white man they were touching sights too on the sand that day i saw one poor negro woman and her baby both tired out they lay sleeping in each other's arms in the sunshine there were the donkeys poor things that had travelled many a mile in the early hours of the morning from distant hamlets numbers of these lay on their sides stretched out and fast asleep ropes are pegged into the sand forming square enclosures and the donkeys' feet are tied there to row so that they may not stray for the most part they looked well kept and tended next we come to the oil merchants with their long pointed earthenware jars stuck in the sand and there are charcoal fires where food is being prepared for the evening meal all goes on in a quiet and orderly fashion no drunkenness no unseemly rows for these people are barbarians on the barren burning sands of africa not christians in the slums of london or liverpool i passed on among that dense cloud of arabs negroes and turks camera in hand and they made way nay helped me balik balik polite and kindly for are they not barbarians and children of the desert end of section fifty eight this recording is in the public domain section fifty nine of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org northern africa part three the mystery of the desert historical note according to the notions of the early geographies the sahara was a broad low-lying expanse of sand silent save for the soft footfalls of camels bearing loads of the treasures of the east even within the last forty years it was supposed to be so far below the sea level that there was serious talk of flooding the western part and changing the climate by digging a canal south of morocco and letting in the waters of the atlantic fortunately before the shovels were set to work it was learned that the sahara is a tableland lying from thirteen hundred to sixteen hundred feet above the ocean and that the lowest part of the region which was to be covered by the waters of the atlantic is five hundred feet from sea level numerous streams flow into the desert from the atlas mountains through deep valleys but generally the water sinks until it reaches a stratum which it cannot penetrate there it remains in mighty underground lakes and wherever this water is brought to the surface an oasis is produced many caravan routes run through the desert the camels carrying manufactured articles to the oases of the desert and returning loaded with gold ostrich feathers ivory iron and salt this trade is made possible by the lines of wells that have been supplied with water from the underground lakes the desert is by no means uninhabited in the west are the moors and arabs dwellers in tents hospitable to their friends but with no compassion upon their enemies in the middle of the wilderness are the Tuaregs, who in the fashion of the Barbary pirates demand toll from all caravans crossing their country. In the east are the Tibus, who live in fixed abodes, raise flocks and herds, and cultivate the ground. More than half of the Sahara belongs to France. The rest is held by Egypt, Morocco, Tripoli, and Spain. End of section 52. This recording is in the public domain. Section 60 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fanu Jahangili. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 60. The Hour of Prayer in the Desert. Latter part of 19th century. By Gilbert Watson. Lightly Biskra shook off the dreams of the tropical night. The white walls of her houses showed like blanched faces in the dawn, silent as fire worshippers awaiting the sun. The fringe of palms facing the east stole on the sight, pale as phantoms, motionless, their drooping leaves awash with silver. Behind the town, the oasis massed itself in impenetrable obscurity. Far off, a neutral tinted line spoke of the desert. Day after day, 
had this line beckoned to me, decking itself in elemental jewels, like a siren seeking to please. And it was not only to the material eye that it appealed, but to that infinitely more subtle sense, the eye of imagination. That pencil line known as the horizon had been to me a daily source of wonder and speculation. Could I but reach it? Could I but see beyond it? What golden lands lost in sunlight might I not discover? A sense of mystery, almost of awe, as though one stood within the doors of some great cathedral, held anticipation breathless. It is not that which we see in life, but that which we hope to see, that causes the heart to beat and the eyes to sparkle. To my ears the word desert sounded magical as did fairyland when I was a child, a name to conjure with, picturing forth a land full of delightful possibilities, a world of wonder shining in a heaven of dreams, and I was to see it at last. Athman had proved himself an efficient organizer. I found myself master of three camels, two as mounts for my guide and myself, the third to be used exclusively for baggage. I beamed upon them with an air of happy proprietorship. To possess camels was to my mind a fall of fortune almost too good to be true. To be able to say come and have three camels coming, and to be able to say go and have three camels going, appeared to me the height of human bliss. Envy itself could not reach higher. The only crumbled rose leaf in my bed of satisfaction lay in the fact that Abdullah, the real owner of my preambulating property, trudged in our rear, and also that the camels themselves appeared to regard me with considerable suspicion. As we moved away, my thoughts reverted to my introduction to this new world, when, on a beautiful afternoon, scarce a week ago, I had caught my first glimpse of the desert. It was an experience I was little likely to forget, and now that I was actually embarked on the high sea of sand, my memory rested on that salient moment with conscious pleasure. Alcantara, the gateway to the desert, lay before me, the beautiful golden gate which many a traveler had delighted to extol. Behind in the desolate valley the hot metal of the gauge winks defiance to the African sun, a sterile and unproductive land bearing its nakedness to the day, but in front the semicircle of cliffs is rent in twain as though a titan's axe had cleft their granite bones, leaving the wound a subject of marvel to all eternity. And gazing through this giant gate over a blur of sunlit oasis, one sees the desert. Another scene, too, connected inseparably with that radiant afternoon returned to me. Standing in the riverbed of the Oued Biskra, with my back towards the desert, I had looked northwards. Among the boulders that mirrored themselves in the stream were two Arab boys. Overhead a palm tree bent above the water as it gazed at itself in the little pools that lay arrested among the rocks. In the background the scene opened not with the sheer abruptness, the brusque violence of the cleft as seen from El Cantara, but with the gentle suavity of introduction leading the eye along shining waterways between lines of palms onwards, upwards to where in the blue of the distance the hills slept in a mantle of sunbeams. Slowly we left Biskra behind us. Life was beginning to awake in the drowsy streets. A dog crept from under a clump of aloes. A child watched us from behind a cactus hedge, while overhead in the clear spaces of the sky a band of swallows wheeled ceaselessly. As we passed the negro village, we met an Arab mounted on a diminutive donkey, driving two other donkeys before him as the twelve tiny hoofs pattered along the mane. The dust rose in dense clouds. It obscured the distance, it veiled the bamboo hedge, it shrouded the little party in a diaphanous mist of silver. There was something extremely dainty in the diminutive animals and their dusky owner, seen thus in the dim light they resembled silver point drawings, mere indications of life, silhouettes sketched with a wet and speedy brush on a background of pearl. Silently we stalked forward, the sponge-like feet of the camels and the sandals of the Arab passed inaudibly over the dusty ground. Gradually the desert opened out before us. It dawned upon the sight from between faint headlands of verdure. To the right, Aelia and Philia, two small oases, showed like islands of misty greenery, 
floating in a sea of pale gray light. Volcanic rocks suggesting the action of primeval fires lay tossed around interspersed with dwarf bushes powdered with silver dust. The camels avoided these obstacles with the leisurely grace of movement peculiar to them, swaying their long necks pendulously and placing their feet with care on the level ground between the ruts. The air was exquisitely cool and clear, its purity, freshness, and faint odor as of time breathed of infinite space. A sense of solemn expectancy pervaded the scene. In the far distance a herd of camels was to be observed. At times they appeared but as a slowly moving dots, and at others they stood out hard and sharp against the skyline. Once we met a family proceeding with scrawards. They attracted the eye from afar on account of the glint of color that focused attention. I gazed at them as we approached, gazed as we passed, turned in my saddle, and gazed again as they receded into the distance. It seemed to me that I could not gaze my fill, that the time taken in the encounter was all too short to sear them upon my memory. So picturesquely did they stand out in trenchant contrast to their surroundings. Foremost came an Arab mounted on a donkey. He was clad in a bareness of a dirty gray color, the hood of which partially concealed his face. His long and naked legs dangled but a couple of inches above the dust of the road. He returned my stare with a look of utter indifference. Behind him paced a camel laden with sacks, cooking utensils, and baskets. Perched high upon these family gods were two semi-naked children clutching a couple of fowls. Over the camel's body, in lieu of a saddle cloth, trailed a party colored sheet of alternate red and yellow stripes. In the rear plodded a woman dressed in an orange robe, a baby bound upon her back. When we were come within a few yards of her, she raised her head. Her eyes fell on us with a dull, unmeaning stare, as though she had long since ceased to take interest in objects beyond the pale of her sad and sordid life. She gave us but a fleeting glance to enable her to avoid us, then her eyes dropped again to the dust. She was unveiled and of pitiable plainness. A face old before its time seemed with many wrinkles. She walked with a limp, one naked foot partially covered with a bandage, showed signs of blood, and her air was the air of one both despondent and weary. The child upon her back wailed, but she had no time to steal its cries for already the steady advance of the animals had left her many yards behind. Slowly they crept into the distance, the donkey picking its way daintily among the ruts, the camel with a stately motion and outstretched neck, the woman limping with bent back and downcast eyes. The sun rose and deluged the plains with light. Barely had his upper rim showed in a line of fire above the horizon. Then at a cry from their master, the camels came to a standstill. The man strode forward, and hanging onto the neck of Atman's mount, brought the animal to its knees. It is out of prayer, said Atman. I watched them as my camel cropped the terebinth shrubs by the wayside, watched them with a feeling of alienation, conscious that from their spiritual world, from their inner life, I was indeed an outcast, destined to remain forever in an atmosphere of semi-comprehension. Atma's love of finery revealed itself even in his devotions. He unfastened the parcel from behind his saddle, which, when unrolled, proved to be a small praying rug. This he spread on the ground, not on the track where the dust lay deep, but on the higher and firmer ground among the shrubs. Discarding his burners and kicking off his yellow slippers, he stepped in his white socks on the mat and stood erect. At the distance of a couple of yards, with naked feet, stood Abdullah. The contrast between them was striking. The one with dark, rough hewn face and splendid figure, the other with fine Arab features, his weather worn frame gone to emaciation. The one in a pale mauve costume lined with crimson, his jacket stiff with embroidery and bright with rows of glass buttons, the other covered only with a grey burnous, ragged and dirty beyond words. <sighs> I watched them prostrating themselves until their foreheads touched the ground, rising to their full height, prostrating themselves anew, and gave ear to the subdued sounds of prayer flowing ceaselessly from their lips. The sun circled even higher. His beams fell full on the two men and flung their shadows far across the dust of the track. 
The red lining of Athman's jacket glowed like a thing of flame. Nearby, the camels waited in attitudes of inimitable patience. There was something singularly impressive in the simplicity of their devotions. The absence of self-consciousness, the unfeigned earnestness, the force of long habit that concentrated attention upon a set form of words accompanied by a set form of movements, all were calculated to strike the least observant. These men, insignificant in themselves, were yet part of a spiritual power so mighty as to ring the world with prayer. Al Islam was awake at that self same hour far beyond our vision, over leagues of untraversed space. Countless voices were raised in supplication, countless eyes were turned with longing to the radiant east. The sight of the holy city symbolized perchance within simple minds by the invariable brightness and majesty of the rising sun. From populous cities, from obscure villages, from oases lost in the Sahara, from caravans far out in the desert, the cry was still the same, Allah. Allah, it rose and fell. The melodiousness of the word lulled the mind, it soothed the soul, it whispered of divine protection. Was it not the angel of hope fluttering her rainbow wings even within the sanctuary of the spirit? Allah, it came again stealing through the sunlight vibrating around us in waves of sound we were no longer alone all the little voices of the desert awoke into praise it was as if a thrill of gladness ran through the weary earth there was a joyous presence in the morning that made itself felt that stirred the hearty worship of their own accord my lips to frame the universal prayer allah i murmured allah akbar allah allah Yes, truly, God is great. End of section 60 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Farno Jahangiri Section 61 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farnad Jahangiri. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 61. The Oasis of the Great Grandfather. Latter part of 19th century by Gilbert Watson. Athman was in a state of high excitement. We were due to arrive at the oasis of his great-grandfather in the course of an hour. It was the second day after our departure from Maghir. We had camped on the preceding night at Netza ben Rezik, which being interpreted signifies the place where ben Rezik died. Who the temporary possessor of this name had been or what he had done to merit renown, Atman was unable to inform me. My charitable guide, however, was fully convinced that the deceased gentleman had passed a life of the greatest sanctity and was in every way worthy of the candle which we presented to his tomb. The ground over which we passed was sacred soil in the eyes of Othman, not a hill heaving itself out of the dun monotony, but held memories for him. Not a village or clump of palms shimmering in the glare, but whispered to him of the past, a tiny oasis called the mother of the falcons was pointed out to me with great pride as belonging to a distant relative, a place where he, Othman, had spent many happy days, a well in the desert known as Ain Karna, or the well of the fig tree, was hailed with ejaculations of affection, which be it confessed, came perilously near to tears when he discovered that the familiar fig tree was no more. It was, however, upon his home, the oasis of Zawiyet, Riba, that Othman lavished the pent-up tenderness of his heart. O oh, Sidi, he cried, to think that in one little hour I shall see it again, the dear oasis that I remember so well. Oh, it is beautiful, but so beautiful. Uh, imagine to yourself the dome of the holy tomb, as it were a bubble of camel's milk floating in the air, and behind the fresh green of the palms. Oh, my great-grandfather's palms. You call them his steel, Othman. But certainly, said he, since they belong to him. But he has been dead so long. It matters not, he gesticulated with animation. They are still his. Listen, I will tell you the story of them. When my great-grandfather died, he left many palms, for he was rich, and this was what he said. I leave all my palm trees, firstly, to the upkeep of my tomb, secondly, to give hospitality to strangers. 
Sidi, these were his very words. Oh, it is a very beautiful idea. Uh, although that, he still feels hungry. How kind that is. How like my great-grandfather. Afma's face glowed. His voice rang with enthusiasm. In a little while, he spied the oasis. Unrest seized him. Nothing would do but that he must dismount and assist Abdullah to urge on the baggage camel, who, it must be confessed, was inconsiderately lazy that morning. When that unaccountable animal utterly refused to quicken her steps, having no such incentive to exertion as an expectant tomb, he was all for mounting again, being convinced that were he but perched aloft as before, he could effectively spur the progress of the party. Then as though to pass the lazy pacing time, he took to feverishly counting on his fingers. On du trois, etc. But every time he reached the number five, he stopped and scratched his head. In answer to an inquiry, he replied, My presence, be my presence. Oh, I hope I have enough. Presence, I ejaculated. What presence? He turned on me a reproachful eye. For my relations, of course. I hope I have forgotten no one. It would be sad to forget even a little one of whose birth I knew nothing. Hmm. Groped in the hood of his burnous and drew from thence a parcel. Opening this, he submitted the contents to my inspection. Isn't that pretty? He held a tiny looking glass at arm's length. It was circular, set in red leather. A flap covered the glass. I expressed unqualified approval. Athman was delighted. It is for my aunt. He chuckled with gusto. How she will... Cry out with joy when she raises the slap and sees her own face and this and this and this. One after another, he dangled before my eyes a variety of articles. A bag of camel's skin covered with cheerful embroidery, a chain of beads that absolutely winked in the morning sun, a charm for the cure of a stomach ache, wrapped in emerald green silk of so delightfully mysterious a nature that even to see it was to be seized with longing to explore its philanthropical contents. Magnificent, I cried. I should think so, he assented, nodding his head gravely. I know they are beautiful, because I am sorry to part with them. We were by this time come to within a short distance of the oasis. Among the palm trees, the dome of a marabout's tomb was to be seen, covered with the usual whitewash. It shone conspicuous in the sunshine. Athman had become silent, but his parted lips and active eyes told of the feelings that glowed within him. They are perhaps working in the fields, he said at length, his voice scarce raised above a whisper. Even as he spoke, I caught sight of a man engaged in irrigation. A primitive who was in his hand. His hake was kilted round his waist. His naked feet splashed in the muddy water. Athman, shielding his eyes from the sun, gazed at him intently. It is uh, Omer, he cried in delight. Hello, Omer. Omer. The man, quitting the little patch below the palms, sprang to the pathway. The hoe fell from his hand. He stared at us open mouthed like one who sees a ghost. Aloui, he screamed, and without another word he wheeled where he stood and set off running toward the village. Othman laughed aloud. <laughs> he is my cousin, he explained in a voice tremulous with satisfaction. He has gone to tell them that I am here, but how he has grown, I, I, would, I would not have believed it. Did you see his beard? Oh, he, he's a fine fellow. That is his garden. What healthy trees, yes. He was always a worker, old city. Is it not all beautiful? Did not all tell you true? Mind you, how slow these camels are. I long to be there. Quicker, quicker. And leaning down, he beat the animal's neck with his open palm. Gently we swayed along the narrow pathway. On either hand we were shut in by mud walls topped with the prickly points of palm leaves. Before we had gone far the village came into sight. At the same time cries were heard and a crowd of men came racing to meet us. Othman was out of his saddle in a twinkling. The crowd surrounded him with glad shouts of welcome. They caught at his hands at his burnous and when that fell off at his hike. Not a soul but clamored for his attention. All spoke at once, no one waited for a reply, the noise was deafening. Athman was tossed among them like a cork on an agitated sea. But he enjoyed it, his black face turned this way and that, radiating happiness. 
He kissed one, embraced another, reached an enthusiastic arm over three intervening shoulders, and clasped hands with a third. Joy was universal. It was indeed a red-letter day for the tribe of Ben Salah. At length we turned our steps villagewards. Othman, surrounded by relatives, walked in front. An old man leaned upon his shoulder. Omar still retained possession of his hand. Hemming him in, marched others, listening open-mouthed to his words, and replying in chorus to his eager questions. Hovering upon the outskirts of the procession were children in a state of excitement and nudity. These little people listened for the sound of his voice, which, when heard, so filled them with joy that they felt themselves forced to turn somersaults in the dust. Even Abdullah joined the ranks of admirers. The camels and I followed modestly in the rear. My tent had been pitched as usual beneath palm trees on the outskirts of the village. Seated within it, I waited the return of Athman. Zawiyat Riba had received him unto itself. The narrow lane that plunged into the labyrinth of mud huts had swallowed not only my popular guide by the entire crowd as well. The camels and I were forgotten. These patient animals hobbled for the night, stood disconsolately each on three legs, more than ever persuaded that times were out of joints and that the terrestrial globe was by no means a planet fitted for the habitation of camels. The scene was deeply penetrated with the sentiment that haunts the approach of night. Across the tender spaces of the sky flew flocks of little birds. They came from the desert in search of the water that lay beneath the palm trees. As they passed overhead, I could hear their glad twittering and the rhythmic beating of their wings. Other sounds, too, broke upon the ear. From somewhere deep within the oasis came the noise of a camel's roar. The weird melancholy cry stirred into consciousness the strange feelings connected with faraway lands. It voiced all that was unfamiliar in my surroundings. Suddenly the beating of a drum attracted my attention. It came from the direction of the village. Feverishly it throbbed, seized and throbbed again. As I listened to it, a laborer passed silently on naked feet. His coarse hike Tilted to his knees, revealed the naked brown of his limbs. The level sunlight splashed him with stains of fugitive color. For a time, the scene before me was radiant with luminous green and gold steeped in transient glory in which the stems of the many palm trees glowed like flames in a dark sanctuary of shadow. Then all at once, everything grew wan and gray. A veil of mystery fell from the sky, only on the far horizon over dim spaces of desert, a thin line of light told of the sun. The sound of flying footsteps aroused me. It was Othman. Breathlessly, he burst into the tent. Oh, Sidi, he panted. Come quickly. Where, Othman? To the village, of course. There is a feast tonight in my honor. His manner was full of self-importance. Come, Sidi, come, he entreated, holding the tent flap open to its widest. I have told of your great kindness to me. My uncle desires to thank you himself. All my relations will be present. Also many friends. I wish to present them to you. I have told them that you are a prince in your own country. A prince? I cried aghast. Osman chuckled at my surprise. Oh, but certainly, Sidi, they are ignorant people. It is necessary to impress them. They will do you much honor. Besides, if they think you are a prince, they will be very pleased that I am your guide. And moreover, the feast. Oh, my you. That is worth seeing. The women and children are making cuckoo now. Many fowls are to be killed. Then, city, there is a negro from the south, a black man, with a droll turban and a drum. It is most fortunate that he is here today. He will make you die of laughing, for when he beats his drum, he dances and sings all at the same time. He is doing it now. We were all looking at him in the streets in front of my uncle's house. Oh, please come, city. He may have finished by the time we got back. I shook my head. Despite the heartiness of the invitation, I made up my mind to refuse. The presence of a stranger, however well-intentioned, could not but impart a touch of restraint to, to so purely domestic gathering. They would, I felt assured, enjoy themselves better without me. For long, Othman combated my resolution, but I was not to be persuaded. At last he desisted and reluctantly bade me good night. You have everything that you wish for, city. His eyes roamed round the tent. The firewood stood ready. My saddlebags lay open to my hand. Everything, Osman. Good night, and enjoy yourself. His impatience to rejoin the merrymakers was very visible. Still for a moment he lingered. 
I wish much that you would come, Sidi. The Negro is really very funny. And I shall not be able to return here when the feast is over. You sleep in the village tonight, then? No, no, tonight I do not sleep at all. Tonight I watch and pray. Watch and pray. He repeated the word solemnly, eyeing me at the same time as though he hoped that I was duly impressed. Yes, Sidi, tonight I burn many candles at the holy tomb of my great grandfather. It is an occasion I have looked forward to for many years. It may be that God will forgive my sins on account of his great holiness. His voice sank to a whisper of veneration. His open palm pressed his forehead, then recovering his wonted manner, he bade me good night and ran at full speed towards the village. End of section 61. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fano Jahangiri. Section 62 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T.J. Burns. The World Story, Volume 3. Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Toppin. Section 62. The Music of the Desert. Latter part of the 19th century. By Gilbert Watson. The long afternoon was drawing to a close. The sun was on the point of leaving us. In half an hour, it would be dark. For in these lands of the south, there is but little afterglow. No lingering twilight drains the lifeblood, drop by crimson drop, from out the veins of day. She is radiant, smiling to the last golden moment. Then, of a sudden, she swoons. The sun god has her in his clutches. His burning arms are around her. In fiery haste, he plunges with her behind the dark horizon. For a minute, there is an agony of dying color. Far continents leap into flame. Then, peace. For lo, a star already twinkles in the sky. And what is even more remarkable is the silence. In northern lands, there are so many audible indications of approaching night. But in the desert, nothing. The tyrant's sun has killed all sound, beaten it down with fierce, reiterated blows until it lies as lifeless as the sand. The silence is deep, unbroken. It enters into your bones. It weighs upon your spirits. It becomes a living presence, a power to be reckoned with. Slowly we climbed, rise after rise and wound our way into the intervening valleys the track had ceased to be a road the ruts of wheels had stopped at sidi okpa and only a stony channel such as might well be mistaken for a watercourse remained to indicate our line of march the monotony was unbroken yet it was full of fascination the sun sinking slowly still deluged the world with light the wind still swept over the wide expanse the sand still drifted like golden smoke across our track suddenly i was awakened out of a brown study by the sound of uthman's flute the dying sunlight streaming past me fell full upon him his blue burnous fallen from his shoulders draped the hind quarters of his camel the scarlet lining of his jacket and the warm red of his fez glowed hot in the sun his eyelids semi-closed revealed the dreaming blackness of his eyes mechanically his fingers moved over the stops the air which he played fascinated me it was wild barbaric unfamiliar full of unexpected turns and sudden inexplicable changes Heard thus, as we swayed through the sunset, it unconsciously associated itself in the listener's mind, not only with the forms of things visible, but also with the influence of things unseen. There were notes of invitation, low, inarticulate calls, 
that were the voice of the horizon there were breathless gasps sound beaten down by exhaustion that suggested weary marches over desert sands there were passages full of dreams that whispered of longing for that which always lay beyond and through it all linking sound to sound ran a thrill of emotion a soft but imperative call that reminded one of spring with a smile at my too vivid fancy i essayed to curb my imagination to think of the music but as an assemblage of unmeaning sounds the effort was unsuccessful what music is that i asked in a low voice it is the music of the dancing girl sidi but not of biskara no of the far south dans le désert du grand sahara his words chimed well with the melody instinctively i strained my eyes toward the south there where sky and desert met in a golden haze my thoughts flew like homing birds into the unknown how full of fascination it seemed how impregnated with mystery how alluring how barbaric might it not be as othman suggested the birthplace of passion hot and unrestrained as its sun i learned it long ago sidi he paused to jerk his camel from a bush i have never forgotten it i love it for its own sake not because it reminds me of dancing girls they bore me you are surprised sidi you think an arab and not to love dancing girls but it is true my friend hamel who is dead mocked me often but you understand i am a poet he drew himself up with a gesture of much dignity fatma for example was beautiful but there was no imagination in her dancing no grace only contortions now this he played a bar with expression that was all but passionate this is altogether different this excites me did fatma dance to that air i asked no sidi never her music was quite ordinary what one may hear any day in the cafes i have never seen any one dance to this music i sometimes think it is lost lost i cried but yes perhaps i am the only one who can play it now who knows an aged man taught it to me under the palms of zaoyat riba he came from the south unexpectedly he came out of the desert and unexpectedly he went back to it no one knew aught of him he told me that this music was an old old air born in the sun but long ago when the world was young beautiful women have danced to it but they are all dead to dance as one should to this music one should have feet light as moonbeams and a soul full of melody and voyez-vous such a woman is difficult to find the old man feared that it would die it was so very old so finding that i could play on the flute he taught it to me then one morning he went away towards the south i watched him go with tears in my eyes he never came back no i looked for him often when the sun sunk behind the palms but i never saw him again never othman sighed a small brown bird flew unexpectedly from under a bush his camel raised a startled head and snarled faintly again othman turned to me sidi he cried in a voice of enthusiasm how i wish you had heard him he played ah yes he played it was like water running in the moonlight 
your soul ran with it. I, do you see, I play. I amuse myself with the flute, but it is a bagatelle, a nothing. Poof! He blew on his bunched fingertips as though he were blowing a feather into the air. Then, becoming serious, he waved an arm towards the south. It is strange, he murmured, half to himself. This music, one would say that it has a soul, the soul of the desert. Not here, but there, far away. Le bas, au sud. Yes, that is it. To me, it is the voice of the south. I started. How strange it seemed to hear my unspoken thoughts returning to me from Othman's lips. His words awoke memories. I, too, had felt something of the feelings that swayed him. I, too, had heard this self-same voice luring me ever farther towards the south, as though it were a living presence, a something tangible, a hand drawing one irresistibly sunwards. I had all but forgotten my surroundings when they snatched me back from dreamland by a strain of music. I started in amazement, yet there was no mistaking the sounds. It was the music of the southern dancing girls, the music that Othman loved. I listened, wondering. How often had I heard it? On the march, in the camp beneath the palms, in the night watches. It seemed strange to hear it in this café, played by other fingers, for I associated it with Othman and had come to look upon it as peculiarly his own. His hand clutched my arm. Sidi, he cried, you hear, you hear my music. His face shone with excitement. His eyes expressed wonder and pleasure. With his disengaged hand, he kept time to the melody. I turned to the orchestra. The tom-tom players were still there, but the negro had given place to an old man. He was seated, cross-legged, on the dais, a little in advance of the other musicians. He had the air of a wizard. His turban and robes were black, and presented a striking contrast to his silvery hair and thin white beard. Age had set her seal on him in many wrinkles, in shrunken frame and toothless gums. But the fire of enthusiasm burned still within his eyes, deep sunken though they were, and overshadowed by eyebrows coarse and white as frosted thatch. His hands twitching on the stops of the flute resembled vultures' claws. It was plain to the least observant that his whole being lived and breathed in the music. At times he swayed violently in sudden jerks, as though shaken by strong, invisible hands. Mon Dieu, it is he, exclaimed Othman. Who? I demanded, but even as I spoke, I remembered. This could be none other than the old man who had taught Othman the melody under the palms of Zawiyat Rabah long ago. The old man who he had fancied dead because he had lost sight of him during the busy days at Biskra. How strange that they should meet here at Taugurt after the lapse of so many years. I was about to speak again when a woman appeared in the doorway, and in the interest which she created, the words died upon my lips. She stood framed between the palm tree logs, motionless, the light of the torches flashing upon her, the starlight seen above and beyond encircling her head in a faint white radiance. Then, as the flute screamed a wild and imperious note of invitation, she moved slowly forward. The Arabs, seated in dusky rows, turned to watch her. Their faces betrayed deep but dignified interest. Two chess players ceased their game. One of them pushed the board away with his naked toes, resettled his turban upon his head, and leaned against the wall. His eyes were semi-closed, but singularly alert. They resembled the eyes of a cat watching a mouse. 
Aspahi, seated on a bench at a little distance, paused in the act of raising his coffee cup to his lips and drew his comrade's attention to her with a gesture. One man alone spoke to her. He was standing within the shadow margin of the door, but as she passed, he stepped into the light, and I knew him for a Bedouin, a wild-looking figure, clad in rags. In spite of the dissimilarity of costume, there was that in the general characteristics of both man and woman that told of a common origin, and I found myself wondering if they were members of the same desert tribe. As she passed, he spoke to her rapidly, almost with ferocity. I caught the glitter of his teeth. She answered with a gesture of little moment, for her expression did not alter. Neither did she pause. The man stood for a second motionless, petrified, gazing after her with the eyes of a dumb animal quivering under a blow. Then, tossing his arms over his head, he sunk once more into shadow. The old man seated on the dais caught sight of her. His eyes glowed with extraordinary fire. His meager body swayed violently. His music sprang to fresh life. A number of wild notes made themselves heard, cried out, screamed with insistent clamor, passed and repassed as it were before our eyes, now singly, now together, uneasy, restless, hungering impatient as caged animals waiting to be fed the tom-toms throbbed in unison monotonous and muffled yet quick and breathless as though the wild music had a heart whose beating could not be stilled by the passion in its voice the stir of expectation increased it passed over the spectators as a gasp of desert wind passes over sultry sand conversation ceased coffee cups were set down and two of the dancing girls whose voices had been raised in altercation were admonished angrily by the negro proprietor the woman paused at the far end of the hall turned to the vacant space across which she had but that moment moved and raised her arms above her head in the attitude of one who listens her appearance evaded description yet though her wild beauty baffled words it remained in the watcher's mind an imperishable memory one trait alone more definite than the others occurs to me now gracefulness every movement told of physical perfection of faultless balance of beautiful limbs obedient to an unerring sense of rhythm to watch her was a pleasure akin to watching wind-blown grass or waves dancing in the sunlight she wore many ornaments her slender wrists and ankles were encircled with bands of massive silver upon her head there rested a small golden crown and depending from her neck were chains of golden coins her costume was savage in its lust for bright colors in its scarlet and green and gold yet seen thus in the yellow light against the dusky background and surrounded on all sides by silent sheeted figures it struck home to a sense of appropriateness not otherwise could one imagine her the effect was barbaric but it was africa the flute cried to her with angry impatience she began to dance her movements were sinuous and slow. The flexibility of her body was remarkable. The performance was full of beauty, yet it was a beauty that verged upon the uncanny. One felt as though this gliding, undulating figure were half snake, half woman, holding her audience spellbound by the force of supernatural charms. Her dancing differed wholly from that of the dancer who had preceded her. Here were no contortions, no jerking of the muscles, no posturing that offended the taste. And yet, in the very refinement of her attitudes lay danger, a danger more subtle in that it was more cunningly veiled than that of her companion. And yet, with all her powers of seduction, 
she was no free agent for one saw clearly that she was thrall to the music like the aged musician she too lived but in this song of the south this soul of the sun made audible it dominated her completely now sending her forth now summoning her back enmeshing her in melody whispering to her in breathless notes calling to her in low seductive tones irresponsible as the first echoes of desire her naked feet passed inaudibly over the mud floor her hands riveted attention they were small with tapering fingers the nails dyed bright red with henna she held them before her at arm's length on a level with her eyes they were never at rest but turned and twisted ceaselessly almost as though they were the hands of a swimmer cleaving deep water at times they trembled the fingers opening and closing convulsively and again becoming rigid they resumed their former monotonous movements the dancer followed them with an air of one walking in her sleep or like one blinded by the excess of light her face heightened the illusion the eyes were open but were sphinx-like in their arrested expression the features composed the mouth quiet it was impossible to tell her thoughts while she danced the cafe was very still the arabs sat like dead men save for the gleaming of their eyes the place was animated only by the lights the music and the dreaming figure that came and went silent as the shadow at its feet a sudden movement at my side drew my attention to Othman. He was leaning forward, his clasped hands pinned between his knees. The torchlight fell upon his face. It was strangely moved. His lips, slightly parted, revealed the glitter of white teeth. His eyes followed the dancer's every movement with an expression that was half wonder, half fear, yet wholly fascination every line of his body bespoke tense absorbing interest he sat like a man under a spell one would say that he had ceased to breathe our companions conversed but he heard them not by the prophet she dances well murmured si abdel muammad languidly ugh grunted mabarka sucking at her cigarette her voice grated on the ear like the cry of an angry jay ugh call you that well that is no dancing a child could do better now i silence cried a voice and a stout arab seated near a pillar turned a reproving face in our direction mabarka grunted again tossed her head in defiance then bidding us an ostentatious farewell waddled through the inner doorway again i turned to the dancer the music had undergone a change more than ever before it breathed of sunlit space of freedom of wandering lives of the love of the desert winds and desert suns the indelible birthmark seared deep within the heart of desert children and as the music beat its invisible wings against the doors of imagination there dawned within the listener's mind the possibility of understanding all of becoming one for a time with the soul of mystery of loneliness and of light that lies far within the heart of the african sun the dancer responded to the change her movements became languid her hands held ever at arm's length yearned towards this mirage of sound her naked feet essayed to follow her eyes were fixed on the mud and plaster walls but she did not see them she gazed beyond for her this cafe with its sordid entertainment its scuttering lights its atmosphere of unwashed humanity was as though it were not her eyes her wonderful dark eyes coal encircled inscrutable wells of sultry light depths of dreaming shadow rested on something which we could not see which we could only surmise to be one with the music 
something far off lost in the great quiet night that hemmed us in with its silence and its stars and as the eyes followed her one idea vague elusive yet becoming every moment clearer more insistent grew within the watcher's mind the desert ay that was it this woman was the personification of the desert her dance was its mystery made visible she suggested to the imagination all that one loved and feared in its illimitable spaces in her one realized the existence of the same beauty the same impassivity the same sinister possibilities abruptly the music ceased a wave of relaxed attention as of a taut bowstring suddenly released passed over the cafe the arabs resettled themselves in postures of greater ease some called for coffee some resumed interrupted conversations and the two chess players turned again to their game from the dancing girl's bench came the sound of giggling a shrill inane noise the old musician seated on the dais stared round him with wide unseen eyes he had the helpless air of one snatched suddenly from dreamland all at once he sprang to his feet hobbled rapidly towards the door and disappeared into the moonlight of the court the voice of the negro made itself heard above the buzz of conversation its tones were angry and loud he was apparently scolding a servant the light splashed the ugly walls with great gouts of uncertain color it gave birth to a yellow haze through which the cafe and its crowd of occupants wavered like the world in a drunkard's eye the atmosphere reeked with the fumes of torches and the fetid odor of perspiration mingling with the subtle scent of musk that carried the imagination captive with its suggestions of far-off land how like you aisha inquired the soft languid voice of si abdel muammin i turned to him he had addressed the question to othman aisha said my guide he spoke in a wondering whisper between his lips the southern name sounded soft as a caress his eyes were still riveted on the dancer who had now begun to collect money from the arabs but certainly continued his friend still speaking in the french language she is a novelty i have seen many dancers as thou knowest but never one like her she has not been here long they tell me she comes from far south from the great sahara no one knows whence she comes or what is the name of her tribe she came here unexpectedly one night with a caravan of bedouins accompanied by an old man but did you say you liked her othman muttered something under his breath i did not catch the words but his tone sounded full of suppressed impatience as though he were annoyed with this soft self-satisfied voice for breaking the engrossing current of his thoughts the dancer came nearer already several pieces of silver adhered to her forehead attached thereto as is the arab custom by the saliva of the donors the white metal glittered like stars against the warm brown of her skin her movements were still suggestive of the gliding sinuosities of a snake or the stealthy grace of a panther as she walked she swayed slightly from the hips an air of voluptuous indolence surrounded her like an atmosphere the long chains of golden coins depending from her neck swung to her every movement the crown surmounting her black hair flashed in the torchlight it gave her a regal appearance as though she were some desert queen exacting tribute from her subjects against the dirty plaster of the walls and the nondescript greys of the arabs her bright costume glowed like a tropical flower a thing of hot colour and intoxicating perfume she reached othman slowly she bent her head and looked him full in the eyes with a hand that trembled visibly 
my guide added his offering to those already attached to her forehead her face held me breathless the music spell had fallen from it like a discarded mask and had given place to an alert appraising vigilance that caused her eyes to gleam bright yet hard as sunlit steel it was difficult to judge this woman dispassionately her beauty and marvellous grace unconsciously influenced the mind in her favour yet as i looked into her face admiration gave place to a feeling that was almost aversion vague uneasy unaccountable caused perchance by the utter callousness of her expression and the absence of all the softer qualities that make for feminine charm we sat silent watching her as she glided between the rows of arabs the scarlet and gold of her draperies receded into the yellow haze paused an instant where the torchlight fell upon the vacant space by the doorway then passed out into the night End of section sixty two this recording is in the public domain recording by t j burns section sixty three of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org western and central africa part one unveiling the dark continent historical note there have been three distinct periods of interest in the exploration of africa the first began with the efforts of prince henry the navigator of portugal he sent one expedition after another down the western coast and in fourteen forty eight a portuguese company was formed for trading in slaves and gold on the coast of guinea just fifty years later vasco da gama doubled the cape of good hope sailed up the eastern coast of the great continent then went across to india and anchored off calicut in the second half of the eighteenth century a scotchman named james bruce who had been british consul at algiers set out to look for the source of the nile on reaching the head of the blue nile he concluded that his quest had been successful and returned to cairo in seventeen seventy three his story aroused much interest and fifteen years later an association to explore africa was formed by this association mungo park was sent out to find the niger he succeeded but on a second trip he was drowned during the third period beginning about the middle of the nineteenth century the exploration of africa has been undertaken not so much for adventure or to carry on trade as to gain scientific knowledge of the land the most famous of the explorers of this time was livingstone though the names of barth speak sir samuel baker du chelieu and others are well known after making numerous discoveries livingstone disappeared and no one knew whether he was living or dead the new york herald sent henry m stanley to search for him the search was successful and in eighteen seventy one the two men met stanley went on several other expeditions to africa at one time remaining five years since then the interior has been thoroughly explored in all directions and a cape to cairo railroad crossing africa from north to south is now under construction end of section sixty three this recording is in the public domain.